why real estate happens, uh, unfortunately, in some way or another. But if you're always out there um, having conversations, life's happening to people, their real estate's happening along with that. So we're going to bring him up and he's going to talk to us about the ins and outs of death, divorce and the real estate transaction. So come on up, Jason. And Chris Cuellar said, and a good guy to call at 2 a.m. I'm not so sure about that. I don't really do criminal law. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to bail you out. Well, I'll probably bail Chris out at 2 a.m., but that's about it. But uh, So anyway, well, nice to have you guys today, and thanks for coming, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to use this because standing for 30 minutes to an hour is kind of a long time. So um, just a little bit about us. So I'm a real estate attorney. I've been licensed since 2005. Um, I'm one of those Californians that moved here for a better life about 18, 19 years ago. Uh, my degree is from the University of San Diego, finished up at SMU. So been here a while, um, married for 18 years. We got married about three weeks before we moved here. Uh, my wife's an attorney as well, but she does that litigation stuff, which I think is really boring, and she thinks what I do is really boring, so it works out well. Um, three kids, 12, 10, and 8, uh, live in Frisco, um, wonderful neighborhood, wonderful people, and love living here. So, um, all right, so, you know, this is one of these kind of deals where we've got about 20 slides, and we can get through this you know, probably in five minutes if no, if everybody's kind of bored or we can get through it in an hour if we've got some good participation. So uh, by all means, I'm all about talking through issues and all that kind of thing. Uh, at the end, I don't know. I don't think they had my information yeah, on there, but uh, but yeah, that's fine. Um, all right. Oh, I see. Just right here. OK, that's fine, too. Uh, but I'll write down my cell phone number uh, in case you guys need it and feel free to call me, text me. I get calls all the time from realtors. Hey, I mean, honestly, 95% of the time, it's not a legal question, right? It's a legal-ish kind of question. And so, hey, my uh, my client's got a rental and he wants to know if it's okay if he goes in and checks out the property. I'm like, well, this is Texas. If you want a shotgun in your face, you can go into the property, you know, but it's, maybe that's legal advice. Maybe it's not. It's more of like, hey, you know, you got a, you got a rental agreement for a reason and you can't just barge in anytime you feel like it, right? There's, there's contract and rules. There are rules. Um, so anyway, uh, we're talking about uh, divorce and death and, and mainly the real estate transaction. Um, I have not experienced divorce personally, but obviously we have friends that have, if not many of us in the, in the room have. And uh, I think what kind of makes it nice or what kind of puts these things together is both of these death and divorce are major life issues or major death issues, I guess. Um, but crazy things happen when people get divorced and crazy things happen when people die. Does anybody have... Um, what are some of the big issues about divorce? It can be personal. It can be, I know a friend. But what, what do you got? What do you, what's your name? Teji. Teji, nice to meet you. Uh, Communication. Yeah. Okay, like between the spouses, between the attorneys. and what? Okay, yes. And Cheating in the game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. We're getting right to that. <laughs> 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 I, I happen to know because I'm in the Cato office in Frisco as well. Um, just like this one, there's plenty of uh, uh, therapists and counselors in the building. So if anybody needs them, they're, they're quality people. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. Communication, it breaks down whether you're talking about in the marriage or whether you're talking about dealing with an attorney on one side, dealing with an attorney on the other side. Sometimes you're not dealing with an attorney on one side. And, you know, as a lawyer, that makes it awfully complicated. It's kind of like dealing with a, a for sale by owner client and you're the realtor on the other side, right? Oh my goodness. It's, it's, uh, it can be a nightmare. So, uh, yeah, so prop huge deficiency of trust. So it, it used to be people that, uh, uh, you know, were married or, you know, they still are legally for at least a while. Um, and, now nobody knows and nobody believes what anybody's doing. They're worried as if there's kids involved, they're worried, okay, you know, my, my now soon to be ex-wife is going to be, uh, uh, you know, 
getting in the ear of my kids and trying to make me look bad. And I'm worried about that. And now I got, I've got to move to a different place. I'm going to get an apartment, you know, am I buying a new house? Hopefully for your sake, they're buying a new house, right? Um, so yes, uh, th those are definitely kind of things that are, uh, that are, you know, that we deal with on those kind of issues. Uh, I had a couple, I had a couple jokes and it kind of, you know, kind of break the ice. Um, but this one kind of, it's relevant. Uh, at, this one, so I was just looking, I was like, let's Google some divorce jokes. I don't know. You know. It's not always easy to make fun of divorce, but this one said, at school, a friend of mine always said that he wasn't going to get married. He was just going to wait 15 years, then buy a house for a woman he hated. <laughs> um, marriage is grand, but divorce starts at 100 grand. Um, <laughs> I don't do family law. I clerked for a family law attorney in, in law school and, and I really don't want to do it, but eh, I don't think it usually costs a hundred grand unless they're really fighting over, you know, the last teacup in the cabinet kind of thing. Right. Um, and what, what's the only thing divorce proves? Whose mother was right in the first place. Right. <laughs> All right. So property division in divorce. Um, well, and, and real quick, before we even get into the property, I know that's what we're here for, but I mean, there are lots of things that happen in a divorce that are outside of the scope of this, but it's it's one of those things just, I think, as realtors and even as lenders, you almost become a counselor when they're going through this process. If you're involved in it, you become a part of it, right? And so it's uh, obviously, they have other people giving them advice about the legal legalities of it, but I do think of, uh, I mean, there are ways, you know, there, there are ways that they... They horse trade, you know, I want the, I want the house, I want the car, you know, or, or we're keeping this or or I want, you know, whatever the blankets. I mean, it depends. I want the dogs. I mean, that's a, you know, it's probably a big deal to, to split up the dogs. Um, but even um, I think of things like quadros. I don't know. Anybody know what a quadro is? Right. The 401k stuff. Yeah, essentially. So uh, those are things to think about. And it'd be great to even uh, down the road, bring in a financial advisor to talk about those as well. Um, and, and we can even talk a little bit about that, how I think uh, a family law attorney is an underutilized resource for people like you and for people like me and for people like Chris Madrid, who's a lender. Uh, they are a lot like realtors where you are the hub of a transaction. You know, I mean, nobody cares about title. Nobody cares about a you know real uh, escrow officer. They really don't even care about a lender that much until they find a realtor who they trust and who they know wants to help them sell or buy a house. And then you are the ones that say, "I know a cleaning person. I know a lawn person. I know you know uh, you know somebody do some stuff around the house to fix it up." You, I know a roofer. They call you for all that. But it's amazing how many times. Uh, the problem with lawyers is we're terrible salespeople, right? So we, you know, a family law attorney says, all right, divorce decree, done. Call me when you want to change your, modify your, you know, child support. And they don't think about how they can refer people out because what happens, uh, and we'll talk about this in here. I don't, I'm, I guess I'm getting ahead of my own self, but what happens is something's happening with the house that they have. They're, they're refinancing it. They're moving out. They need to buy a new house. They need to, you know, whatever. They're both selling and getting their own new houses. So they have a they have an immense ability to be able to refer to other partners. They just don't for for most most lawyers I know don't think about that or don't care about it because plenty of people are getting divorced and they don't think about networking, right? And so uh, I'm probably one of the few that do because I do title and that's 95% of what I do. We have six offices around the Metroplex, Frisco, Denton, Justin, Mansfield, Dallas, just opened up in Keller as well. Um, so we're all over the place, but this is what we do. We do title. I'm not a lawyer who, uh, has this title company thing off to the side. I'm over here doing immigration law all day and, you know, whatever they do is fine. It's just making me money. No, 95% of what we do is this. So I, I like to consider myself a small business owner. I have eight employees and six offices and I'm doing whatever I can to make their lives better so that they make your lives better and they make your clients' lives better. And uh, I love what I do. Um, okay, property division and divorce. So like I said, there's 401k, there's other stuff to, to talk about, but obviously we're here for real estate. Um, one of the most difficult assets to divide during divorce is that of a real estate property. Um, we get some reasons here, but it, I think it's kind of you know obvious. I mean, there are two people living in a home and there are either going to be zero people living in that home or one person living in that home, right? 
Um, so uh, the other issues, especially around here, uh, the, the, the home accumulates a lot of equity. So how are we going to divide that? What if, uh, I mean, I bought my house in 20, 2010 uh, in the trails of West Frisco for $215,000. Got a deal on it because somebody got divorced. <laughs> I mean, well, you know. <laughs> But it was probably worth about 250 at the time and needed some work. She really loved blue and blue tiles. So we had to get rid of a lot of stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, now my house, I'm sure I could get six, 650, maybe even close to 700,000 for it. And yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem is then I have to move somewhere, right? <laughs> well, abundance of help all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, it's in the right room, I'll tell you that much. Uh, so yeah, a lot of equity, that means, okay, well, if I have, what, 400000 in equity, and that's all the money I have, or maybe I have a little bit in, in 401k, well, maybe, how do, how do we split that up, right? How are we going to deal with that if, if we don't have an extra 200000 to throw to, you know, well, to me, I'm sure my wife would kick me out of the house and I wouldn't get to stay there, but... Um, so yeah, how are you going to pay off that other person? You know, all those kind of things, right? And and not to mention all the other things involved in a divorce. This is just, it's so easy for us to be like an accountant and say, well, here's the numbers of everything. But as we all know, this is a hard issue, not a transactional issue. And you know that even just selling and buying a house. I mean, you know, it's it's like, okay, look, can we just give them a $1,500 seller credit so we get the stupid thing done, right? You know, and they're like, oh, I'm not giving them another red thing. You know, so it's a it's a hard issue and, and it's it's definitely more than just a transactional issue. So the home can accumulate a lot of, uh, of equity. I also think about the other side of that. What about people that just bought a home last week and now everything's kind of topping out for a little bit and maybe even takes a little bit of a dip depending on where you live and maybe, maybe Frisco Prosper Salina is a little different or maybe uh, uh, maybe a higher dollar value is, is harder, maybe a lower dollar value is still a little easier to get into. I remember when we moved into Savannah, when we moved here in 2004 up on 380, we were the second person on our street and we bought our house for $160,000. And when we sold in 2010, we took a $5,000 loss because it was uh, right when the, and some people are shaking their heads in the background, that was kind of right when the great financial crisis happened. Savannah at the time, you know, there was no Salina and Pro Prosper's where Deion Sanders lived and he had his football field out there in the back. Um, actually, that's kind of like right here, isn't it? It's, yeah, we might be in, are we in Deion's house? I forget. Um, so, you know, uh, back then it was, uh, that was, they were in the middle of that subdivision and they could buy a brand new house for the same price I was trying to sell my house for. And they could pick out their own carpets and they can pick out if they want the bonus room or not, you know, and those kind of things. So we, we sat on our house for 10 months before we sold the house. So, and we were just moving into town, you know, moving into Frisco, um, going to the same Kroger that we used to back then, because that was the closest closest grocery store at the time. So uh, people that are getting divorced though, you know, they don't even have that luxury. So now we're dealing with negative equity. Is somebody gonna pay me to get out of the house? Or, you know, I don't know, that's probably a good, crazy deal, right? So uh, we have a couple issues. We have positive or negative equity, uh, the fact that both people are in the home. And the other one, of course, is that not only are we in the home, but we're dealing with equity, right? That means uh, a lot of times we're dealing with debt. And if we're dealing with debt on 95% you know, of homes or having a mortgage somewhere, uh, then that just adds a whole nother uh, wrench into the uh, machine, you know? And so it, it's, uh, it can make it difficult. So as a result, Bottom there, most personal property, stocks, bonds, and financial accounts are easier to, to divide. I'm sure that you could get an accountant or a financial advisor to say, not so fast. We've got some 401k things to deal with, um, you know, potential future growth, all those kind of things. But I think uh, because of real property's nature and because we're dealing with a home, not just a house, then it becomes a whole bigger ball of wax. Because when you're dealing with accounts, it's more of the biggest ball of wax I think could be, okay, maybe we had somebody who worked as, as a homemaker and then we had somebody who had a career and if they're getting divorced, okay, now we, need, now we need the person who wasn't didn't have a job outside the home, you know, how are they going to be able to survive? That's different than 
uh, I mean, with, with a house, it's okay. Are we both leaving? Or what about the kids? You know, or, I mean, it's it's just exponentially more difficult. And there's more rules involved with what we do. Things have to be recorded of record. We have to get all sorts of parties involved, as you know, inspectors, appraisers, lenders, you know, all those kind of people. And so uh, lawyers, you know, all of us, we like to make things difficult on every transaction. So uh, I think dividing a property and divorce is, is very difficult. So so we have a couple options when we're dividing a home and people are getting divorced, right? Um, I think I think there's mainly two, but what what do you guys think? What 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 options do we have? We have Sarah Stone. There's one of them right there. I kind of cheated or for you, but find out and give the other party you can find out the party out. Yeah, yeah. So you can sell or refinance. Those are uh, those are honestly that's pretty much about it. Unless you want to sell the yeah sell the home refinance the home, we got to deal with equity and those kind of things. So we'll get into it. Uh, sell the home. The home can be listed for sale with a real estate broker and sold. You know, there's plenty of people in here that would love to help them out with that. Uh, the net proceeds of the sale would then be divided uh, between the spouses as any other asset in the marriage. That's true. Glad he didn't put equally here because that's ideally what happens, but it doesn't always happen that way. It, of course, there's factors involved in all of that. Um, uh, this route promotes certainty, is easy to calculate equity and remove significant liability and entanglement entanglements that come with joint ownership and liability. Yes, that's true. Um, let's see if I had any other notes here on that. No. So it is more certain, but obviously when you have kids, um, I mean, I was thinking, me and my wife were thinking about this and we weren't thinking about contemplating divorce, but we were contemplating the death part of this, right? And and we thought, okay, our kids have been going to Fisher Elementary and Cobb Middle School now for 12, you know, eight years or something. And we lived in our neighborhood since they were born. I got my oldest is 12. Um, if something were to happen to both of us, we actually would want one of her brothers to move into our house. They don't have kids. They're just single and uh, live around the area. We would want them to move into our house. So our, like, you know, if your parents are going to be gone, at least they have the stability of being in the same house that they were in, right? And so we we're trying to think through those issues rather than, Okay, let's just sell the house. They can put the money in a trust and go live with my in-laws who, you know, are 81 and 76. That's probably not the best idea either, right? And so, um, again, it, when there's kids involved, we all know it just, it makes things a lot more complicated and it's, it's kind of, astra, it, it, it escalates. It's not just a plus one, you know? And so um, I like to say, I have three children and, and if, you have, if you have two children, there's two relationships there, A to B and B to A, they have relationships with each other. And when you throw a third one in, now there's six relationships because each kid has two relationships with the other siblings, not to mention parents. So everything just sort of exponentially grows the more people that are in your family, uh, even if you have in-laws around that are in your ear or friends, church, you know, it just becomes more complicated when, when we deal with just selling the home outright. Has anybody had anybody recently where they decided to sell the home, split the equity and they both moved somewhere? No. So typically what we see is somebody's going to stay there, right? Yeah. That's kind of what I see as well. Um, so the second most com common option, conveying to the spouse, uh, the one that's going to stay there. So when children are involved, the primary parent may choose to stay in the home. And I, I guess that's that's the good point there is when children are involved, kind of what I just said. Um, when children aren't involved, that's when I see married people decide we're just going to sell this house. You know, we don't have kids. This was a mistake. <laughs> We're going to go our separate ways. And, you know, we don't, nobody wants to stay in the house that they got a divorce in. And they just kind of take the equity and go, right? Uh, has anybody, uh, we're going to, we're getting, we're getting into the conveying to the spouse. Has anybody dealt with a divorce situation recently? Okay. A decision for? Oh, okay. Okay. She has until the end of April. Okay. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about that. Anybody else? I had one where we got to the closing table. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. And uh, I found an off market property for my clients. It was when everything was just insane bidding wars right and um that's hard to do and they had a divorce decree and that divorce decree it said that this other broker had to represent so even though i found it off market 
So I wasn't really involved on the list side. But they had the divorce change and they also had a side agreement, which showed she had bought him out of the house. Okay. Well, he ne she never told him she was selling the house. And then whenever he sees the, you know, the settlement statement. He's like, what's he's going like, on here? What? No. Communication, he's, right? <laughs> agreed to. And she wouldn't, she wouldn't share the, the proceeds. Oh, boy. And so, yeah. So, and then it ended up in, um, he hired an attorney afterwards because my clients wanted to sue for this. Uh, specific performance contract and i've never been in all of my transactions have always been you know everybody's pretty much happy and so that one i really i wish i could have been involved on yeah the list side because i never got to then i could have dived into the divorce decree the side agreement I, and that's the thing that really why i'm here at this class because i want to know like I know about a divorce decree. I never got a divorce myself, but all these weird side agreements and right. I mean, what takes precedent yeah. and kind of, you know. Yeah. Anyway. Well, and and that's that brings up a lot of good points. What was your name? Megan. Megan. Brings up a lot of good points because uh a lawyer is a lawyer is a lawyer, but everybody does different things, right? And uh I concentrate in title and real estate transactions before I was a fee attorney, they call them fee attorneys when your, your law firm is affiliated with a title company. But before I did this, I did oil and gas title work for uh, oil and gas companies would go lease the minerals from somebody and then they would drill for oil and gas. Well, they need to make sure that who they're leasing from is the people that they're supposed to lease from. And if they assign those rights to other people, it gets, it gets pretty complicated, but, um, but Title is kind of what I do, right? And I do uh, about the only other thing I do is I'll, I'll help with LLC documents, but that's usually related to a closing. Um, and wills and trusts, I'll do those. I don't really market that a lot, but I mean, I, I help out realtors, uh, realtors and brokers with that, uh, friends and neighbors, people I know from church that ask, you know, and, and I help that out. So uh, that's about the only other thing I do. Um, but again, uh, these things are, <laughs> you get, family law attorneys who that divorce is done. So they don't, a lot of times, some of them do, but a lot of times they're not following up with things like, oh, well, we said you're getting the house, so we need to facilitate a deed to get the deed into your name. Or we need to facilitate some security instrument or an agreement to do that. Even the things like the quadro that we talked about, um, when I was working with uh, a family law attorney uh, when I was in law school, just, just clerking, she didn't even draft those. She just had an attorney that did those. Oh, he's the quadro guy. Email him and call him up. Well, it's 15 years ago, so call him up. Sometimes he'd email. And, uh, and they would do them for a set fee and then bring them back into the fold kind of thing. And so uh, I think a lot of times what happens is, unfortunately, the client thinks everything is fine. I'm doing this the right way. But then you get to the other side of it, and then you have some other lawyer, some realtor saying, oh, no, actually, you know, you're trying to list this house, but you don't have the authority to do it. Or you're trying to list this house, but you've got this side agreement over here that says, I'm going to pay you 50000 in equity. But there's nothing in the records that got recorded. So how's the title company going to know about this, right? So meanwhile, you know, everything you think is fine. And title company on our end, we're like, oh, wait, nobody told us they were divorced. They just said they were married or they were a single. You know, and we didn't know that they just finished this up. And we don't have these agreements because they weren't of record. And so now, yeah, that's a title company horror story as well. Oh, wait, you're, where's your spouse? <laughs> you know? And even, even if they're married, where's your spouse? I didn't know they had to come. You know, uh, I'm just getting this loan on my own. All right, well, is your spouse moving in? Yeah. Okay, well, we're a homestead state with uh, lots of specific rights. You got, they got to sign on that mortgage document too, even if they're not the borrower, right? Yes, sir. One of the biggest challenges as a broker, I've been in this one a few times. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So I think the biggest challenge with us is how we communicate 
openly and exposed properly with all the parties. And you know, I've, I've, I've sat in the middle of two people who want to kill each other. Mm -hmm. and, and, and both of them love me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a balancing act, but yes. Yes, yes. And, and I've been married 45 years. So I am. And I think what the guy say is if you haven't ever thought about telling somebody you ain't been a lady. Yes. You know, you, you gotta be able to communicate and be able to understand what the dynamic is and keep the main thing the main thing. So you, you gotta keep the, the, the main thing is the main thing, not the little thing. Yep. You know, make sure the other one gets their information that they need to get timely, but don't listen to all the subjective opinions about why you ain't going to dance or why she's lying. Right. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And and again, that's why I think it's more of a hard issue too, because it's more your bedside manner when you're dealing with clients, right? I mean, the first, I even had somebody, gosh, who was it the other day? Um, they said, uh, a lot of what I learned, I learned when I worked at Bennigan's. I'm like, really? Tell me about that. And they said, well, I get up to a table and immediately you're making assessments. Are they here for lunch? That means they don't want to screw around. They need lunch before so they can get back so they're not in trouble, right? It's going to be a quick turnaround. Um, if they're in deep in conversation, this might be a business meeting. So I'm not going to interrupt them every five seconds. Hey, do you want to refill? I'm just going to casually slide a, a glass across the table, right? Um, if it's a family, you know what? You're sitting them in the back with all the other kids because you don't want anybody getting bothered. But I mean, you know, so there's all sorts of different parties that come to a restaurant for different reasons. If they're, you know, if they're looking and they have a deep conversation, it's very, you know, like maybe they just got done with a, you know, being a doctor and they're sick, you know, I mean, you know, so all those kind of things and you kind of have to react to those kinds of things. It's the same thing with realtors. It's the same thing as an attorney. I mean, we're all the same when it comes to that. Like we're in the service business, you know, um, uh, we have a tangible asset that we're trying to get done. Um, but I would say a lot of attorneys don't, they just don't focus on that. I mean, a title attorney, I'm, I'm in the business of getting a deal closed just like you are. Right. And so what can we do within the rules, obviously, but what can we do uh, be, to be creative or to think of a, outside the box when it's not a normal, everybody's happy transaction? Uh, what can we do to figure out, to put everybody in a good position to succeed, right? And get a deal done. And uh, I think that that's some of the trouble that maybe you have when you deal with the outside counsel, because they're thinking about, I'm just getting a divorce done. So I'm doing a divorce decree. You guys handle the rest of that, right? And you end up in, a, in trouble like that. So, um, but I think that like, like what you were saying, sir, it's uh, the communication is key. What you know, you need to be able to explain to other people. And, and honestly, you don't need to know everything. You just need to be able to identify things and then put them in a place to go talk to somebody, right? I mean, if you see something on a title commitment that says, you know, deed of trust, da, 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 or somebody died, we need the probate, da, da, da. you don't need to know all the probate code and the probate law. You just need to identify this might be a red flag. Or this might be a yellow flag. So we need to put them with somebody who can get this solved, right? Like you're not here to solve every probate issue in the world. You're not here to solve every divorce issue in the world. Uh, that's what we have family law attorneys and courts for. But we at least know, okay, this might cause an issue. You said they were going through a divorce. That's kind of one of my big red flags. I'm going through a divorce. Can I get a refinance? Well, you could, but your soon-to-be ex-husband's going to have to sign that too. Oh, no, we haven't talked to each other in six months. He lives in Mexico now. Okay, well, I'm glad you told me because this is going to be even harder than I thought. You know, like we're, you know, now you're thinking, okay, we're getting into all sorts of other stuff. I've got to get like a consulate appointment and get this person to sign in Mexico, you know, all sorts of things. So, um, all right, we'll move on. So when a refinance is not possible, the acquiring spouse may assume the mortgage indebtedness and promise to pay. Uh, the conveying spouse will receive the deed of trust to secure assumption signed by the acquiring the spouse. So, yes, ma'am. So, um, it's already been split out with their divorce and they have a divorce decree that they uh, say she gets the house that he gets the estate or something like that. Yes. Um, when, when the time comes years later and they need to buy the house, uh, do they need it filed the other house fund? You want a great attorney answer? It depends. <laughs> uh, uh, ideally, 
And so I also tell people there's what's legal, there's what's practical, and then there's what's insurable. So just because something's legal to do doesn't mean my title underwriters at Chicago Tyler are going to be cool with it, you know. Um, so ideally, we would have a deed from the one spouse to the other per the divorce agreement, and it'll be a warranty deed, or and, and I think we even have it in here somewhere. It says, yeah, it says special warranty deed, but I mean, sometimes a special warranty deed, sometimes it's a general, uh, that part doesn't matter. What does matter is don't get a quick clean deed. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Remember, if you forget anything, don't have anybody do a quick clean deed. They don't mean anything. No, I mean, it says all that I own, I quit claiming it and I give it to this person. But it doesn't warrant that you own anything. I could quit claim your house to him. And it doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, because I, you know, I don't even own your house. But if I did, then I quit claiming it and I give it to you. There's no warranty language involved in it. And often, often, I mean, almost always, unless sometimes with the probate and things like that, um, uh, they, don't, they don't count. You got to go back and find the previous person and get them to sign an actual warranty deed. It's a pain in the butt, but uh, a special warranty deed is essentially a warranty deed that we, uh, we are warranting title, but only for the time that I owned it, not previous in the history. That's what a general warranty deed is. So it's not like this is a special deed that we're doing only for divorce. It's just specific. Special warranty deeds typically happen in commercial because they don't want to warrant title or issues with like environmental stuff for, you know, before they own the property. Typically with what we deal with, it's general warranty deeds and, and residential type things. Uh, it, yeah, typically it's easier if we have a deed from the spouse to the new spouse who was awarded the property in the divorce decree. The divorce decree itself conveys title though, but it may mean that you have to take the whole divorce decree, get an, uh, an exemplified copy and record the whole divorce decree in the, in the deed records. It would, it would, but it's also a 40 page document. It's got all your information about your kids in there. You know, it's a whole document. You can't just take the one piece of paper out that says wife got the property and, and record that part. You'd have to do the whole thing. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's just easier if they have a deed. And again, a lot of times, you know, like pen law attorneys don't think about that, right? And, and even estate plan attorneys, when they're doing wills and trusts, like when I do a power of attorney, um, I'm making sure that it's signed in a lawyer's office because when, when they go to do a cash out refinance down the road, um, if they need a power of attorney, that power of attorney had to also have been uh, signed in a lawyer's office or at a title company, just like cash out refinances have to be signed in a lawyer's office or at a title company. Um, so anyway, so the deed of trust is secure assumption will allow, how much time I got, Chris? What's the cutoff? One or we? Okay, that's fine, yeah. All right, deed of trust is secure assumption. This is when one spouse is getting the property. Uh, the lien is held by the conveying spouse. So, you know, if, if I'm getting divorced and my wife's keeping the house, um, there's a deed of trust to secure assumption. It's important, it is important for the conveying spouse to notify the mortgage lender. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, in writing so that, that in the event of foreclosure, the lender will notify the conveying spouse of the impending foreclosure. So this is a way to, uh, and obviously there's a lien involved in this kind of deal, right? So I'm, I'm splitting up with my spouse. Uh, my spouse is keeping the house, but there's a mortgage already. Well, this uh, the issues created with that is now, if she's keeping that mortgage, well, first of all, am I good? No. It's my credit too. And I signed that loan and the lender doesn't care that I'm getting divorced. I'm still on the hook for that loan too. So that's a, another, like, I think a lot of times people think I'm getting divorced. They got the house. So now, you know, I can, and I don't know, Chris Madrid or somebody else that's a lender can, can tell me if it affects their credit. But I would imagine if you're on the hook for a mortgage over here, that's really going to screw up your DTI, your debt to income ratios, right? And so you're not even going, I think a lot of times people think, oh, this is good. They've got the house. They're going to make the payments. I'm fine. I'm a new bachelor. I'm going to go buy my own bachelor pad. And uh, now they say, oh yeah, you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, but you got this $5,000 mortgage payment over here. You're not going to qualify for anything, you know? And so I think people are on the hook for credit that they didn't realize. And the, and the credit guy in the back probably is, yeah, he's like, yeah, I see that all the time. Um, uh, so what this does is allows you to be essentially almost a second lien. So if your spouse that kept your mortgage doesn't make the payment, the lending company, the mortgage company who has the first lien will notify you as the ex-spouse, hey, if you want to make up these payments and take over, you can. 
And so that's what this allows you to do. So they may have had an agreement like that, but it sounds like they might've had an OLT lien, which we'll talk about that in a second too. So does that, does that effectively, I mean, you're certainly just having that person on, on the note. Uh, yes, on that original so, loan, yes. Not paying. That's created a financial issue of right. forbearance or, a, or foreclosure, or the rest of our, um, has now that, that foreclosure will still be all those late leading up that foreclosure will still be on the note holders, which will lead to the spouse that thought they were free and clear because the transferred the deed. Yep. They thought, well, the deed's done, we're good. No, just we got to the note. Yep. Still yep. There's title and then there's debt, right? And and notes and debt, that's 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 a separate contractual arrangement between you and a bank or between you and a mortgage company or between you and you know <laughs> private money, it doesn't matter. Uh, but yes, so this just allow this is an even the, the, a deed of trust to secure assumption, D T T S or whatever, you know, whatever the number of letters are, um, is is an agreement between you and your ex-spouse. You know, like who's you know, in case fine, you keep the house, ex-wife. Uh, but I'm going to get this deed of trust to secure assumption, which means I get to step into your shoes if, if you're not making the payment, they're going to foreclose on you. That's why it's saying in the other one, hey, notify the, the lender that we're putting this in position because you want the lender to call you. They want You want the lender to call me in case ex-wife's not making the payment. That way I can make up all those payments and have her deed the house to me. And, and at least you're saving the house, maybe the kids from having to get foreclosed on and move somewhere else, that kind of thing. So it's kind of a... A fail safe in case the original plan's not working out, kind of thing. Now, most of the time, even these don't happen because the problem is, well, ex spouse that's moving out, they're still on the hook for this loan. I'll tell you, but I'll tell you this much: if I ever get divorced and I got a mortgage, I'm not staying on that mortgage. Like, fine, and you refinance the house and get out of it, then, right? Um, and, and that's kind of the other the other style of this. Now, we may start seeing more of these because of the rates, how they've fluctuated, you know, I mean, I've got a 15 year at two and a quarter. It's so sweet, you know, but if, if I got divorced now and I'd be calling up Chris Madrid and like, Hey man, I need a refinance. Yeah. Great. It's 7%. Shoot. You know, and, and I, I don't even know, you know, lawyers don't do math, but I don't know the difference between the monthly payment for two and a quarter and the monthly payment for seven or seven and a quarter, but I imagine it's a lot, right? So, oh. You don't matter. You don't matter. Yeah, we are roommates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's. <laughs> we need to put that as option three, right? <laughs> We're roommates. Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially in this kind of market, it's you know you got somebody you know you may not like each other. We can't afford to live here anymore. My house was two hundred thousand when I bought it, and now it's seven hundred thousand. I can't live here. You know? So we're gonna stay here and keep our mortgage payment, and, and we'll be in different rooms. You know. <laughs> and so, if any of you have seen a divorce decree, you you know that most likely you have. It's usually sixty or ninety days. You're mentioning your client had you know until whatever. It's probably because the divorce decree said. Uh, no, you said she's six months. Okay, well that's. But of course, they still just wait until the end, right? And <laughs> and then, and as we know, to refinance a home, you're lucky if it's a month long process, or even selling a home, you're lucky if it's a month long process. So uh, now we're all less busy than we were a year ago. So maybe it could be a three week process. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Got less to do, but uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's really important. Uh, and maybe this is a strategy for you guys as as you're marketing out there and looking for clients. Is maybe find some family law attorneys and say, hey, this is how I can help you. This is how I can help you prevent issues down the road and put your clients in a good position. Doesn't cost them anything. It just says, "Hey, I know I know Jill Smith, and she's great, and she's helped other my clients, and she'll make sure to get you where you need to go." Or, "Hey, uh, this is Chris Madrid. I know you're staying in the house. We got 90 days to refinance. We have six months to refinance. Let's get it done now, so that your bitter ex-husband doesn't force you back to court and make you pay a bunch of money to resolve something we could have just resolved." You know, those kind of things. Yes, yes. Right. 
Yes. I mean, I want your love for this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't want so when, when you know, Right. Want oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And, and you know, it's all kind of like uh, increasing levels of comfortableness and trust. And at least it's not the ex's realtor friend. I hated I hated Misty anyway, and I don't want her selling our house, you know, or, and at least it's somebody else saying, why don't you guys use like, a, you know, I've used them before you, neither of you have used them before. It's almost like picking a mediator kind of thing, right? You know, like somebody's got to pick one. So you might as well have a third party pick one. That might be a good little way to get some extra business or create a good new relationship. Um, so the other side of this, this is just, you're assuming debt if the other person can't take care of business, right? Well, most of the time we're dealing with all right, well, one's leaving, fine, then I want half the equity, right? Okay, well, sure, yeah, that makes sense. If I, especially if I got 400,000 in equity in my house, you know, that's great. Almost as much as my student loan, so I'm like net zero. So um, so equity has increased, obviously, paying on mortgage, appreciation of the home. Most of us, it's appreciation of the home recently. Um, home improvements, I don't know, people just around here, it's like, what's the square footage, you know, and go off of that. Um, so they're usually selling and splitting the cash out uh, equity or refinancing the home. Is Chris still here? Chris, you back there? Oh, okay. A lot of times when they're uh, getting equity out of the house, it's kind of a, an exemption to the cash out rules where they don't have to pay the additional, uh, well, the additional interest rate for it because it's considered one of those liens that can be paid off and not qualify for cash out purposes, which actually will save them some money. So um, kind of a side note. Um, Horse trading happens a lot. Okay, fine. You're keeping the house. Somebody else said, oh, you're keeping the business. I'll keep the house. Or you're keeping the house, but I'm keeping the, the nice car and you're going to have to go buy a car. You know, there's all sorts of things that happen like that, right? Or I'll keep the house outright and you just take your 401k and get the hell out of here, right? So um, there's a lot of that that happens as well. So it's not always just this 50-50 split, but it does happen. Um, so when they are taking equity out, they do what's called an old T lien. And, uh, and these aren't my slides, they're Chris's slides, uh, full disclosure. But think of an old T lien as IO, that's a good way to put it. This is essentially a lien between the two, you know, the, the current one staying there and the, and the X as the banker lender to pay the extra um, equity in the home. Sometimes that's, hey, we're keeping this lien on here until you refinance and then I just get paid out at the end. Um, Sometimes there's interest rates on there. Sometimes you're paying me a monthly payment and it's just a second payment you're making just like your mortgage payment. So terms are just like your contracts. These are contracts. The so terms, they can change and vary. Um, we have one right now that uh, essentially the lender needed it there to qualify them. So it's not a cash out. So I drew up an OLT lien. We'll record it. And then it's just going to get paid off right at closing anyway. But that way they secured their half of the interest in the equity, you know, the ex, the person not staying in the house, they're securing their interest. So this, real quick, this is what I, probably you had going on is like they had a side agreement. Well, the side agreement is probably an OLT lien or it should be. The agreement, it sounds like, wasn't an OLT lien. It was just the parties agreed to it, which is called a Rule 11 agreement. It's something with the Rule 11 in the courts, but it's the attorneys agreeing to something on behalf of the parties kind of outside of court. Or even if it was in court, hey, this person's getting X dollars in equity. And then they say, y'all figure it out, basically. Like, you know, judges are like Congress. They're like, here's the law. You guys figure out how to apply it. Saw how much because it had appreciated so much. Yes. And he's like, wait a minute. That happens in death a lot, too. Yeah, absolutely. This is what I would, we agreed to, but you're getting way more because yep. of the market. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and and gosh, last year and two years ago, you could you could agree to get divorced on one day, and four months later, your house is worth fifty thousand dollars more. You're like, hey, what's going on here? You know, and I mean, it's the same thing as like the price of building materials around here. You had a, a is that the same as a wraparound loan? No, no, no. And so that's a good question too. Wraps, I consider more of um, well, you you have an uh, an initial loan. It's more of an investor tool, really. So you have an an initial loan that's not being paid off at closing. An investor says. I'll take over your loan and I will wrap a mortgage around that when I sell it to somebody else because they can't just pass that loan to somebody else. They're trying to make a little extra money on finding a deal and selling it off to somebody else. So the wrap would be, I'm selling to somebody else on a mortgage. They're paying me. I'm taking that money, paying the original loan, and I'm keeping the difference. An assignment? Yes, very similar, but 
they're usually keeping it or they're selling it and becoming an owner financer. So it's a little different. Um, yeah, investor deals, they like to get tricky. I like investors that are uh, pretty straightforward rather than not. Um, all right, so we got a couple minutes. We'll go over death. Um, On the divorce, yes. I've actually never listed the spouse was proposed. Right. What would the most important questions be? And the, would the divorce decree, doesn't it need to be finalized before you can list their house? Obviously. Yes. In fact, but I wrote that down as one of my things to talk about. Important questions to ask. When you're at that listing appointment, yes. what do they need to know if they're ready to proceed? First question, is your divorce finalized? Because I get plenty of people, hey, I want, uh, I'm about to get divorced. I can, can I just refinance into my own name? Like if he deeds it to me right now, can I do that? No, no, you are divorced or you are married from the date of marriage to the date of divorce or the date of death. And in between, the law considers you married. It considers community property, community property. It considers, you know, all of that. So it considers homestead laws that way. So even if, I, you know, we're married and I deed it to you so you can refinance because I'm going to hit the road soon, I would still have to sign on the, uh, the refinance because there's homestead laws protecting the current spouse that lives in the house. So, yes, are they married? That's a big, uh, when is the divorce going to be complete? Because a lot of times they're trying to jump the gun and say, hey, I want to list the house. Let's get it going. I'm going to get my decree soon. Yeah, sure you are. You know, and it's like, you know, I mean, who knows, you know, and so if it's not finalized, the other spouse is going to have to sign off. Um, is it best for them to do it before they get the divorce? Sell them before they divorce? Make it easy? I don't think so. I think it makes it harder, to be honest. I mean, I think the hardest. I think the hardest parts about negotiating the sale afterwards is figuring out who's going to be representing who and all that kind of stuff. If they are on the same page, then it doesn't matter when they sell, if they're on the same page. So yeah, from that standpoint, right, uh, reasonably. Uh, the hardest part I see is we split up nine months ago. I just finally filed. I haven't talked to him in a year. I don't even, you know, I don't even know where he is or I barely do. And I don't talk to him that much. It's, it's going to be really hard to get him to come to the closing table, you know? And so it, it really, again, that's kind of a feel thing. And that's part of like, you know, you're the server at Bennigan's. You're over there trying to figure out what the best way to handle it is. And there's no right or wrong. It's what's probably the best way to get your client in a position to succeed because you don't want them to get sued down the road because nobody's showing up to closing, that kind of thing. So if you wait until they're divorced, we know that somebody owns it and one person owns it and only one person has to show up. If you're doing it before, you just have to, you know, Put everything, all your ducks in a row. All right, so death and probate. Um, all right, so somebody has a will and they come to you and say, hey, I want to I want to close this house. Another red flag. Uh, my mom just died and I'm inheriting this house, so I want to list it and sell it. We good? No. No. Listen, right. Yeah, you got to be you got to be like a lawyer, which is like a three year old kid. Why? You know, ask why and ask what. Okay, what do you mean you inherited this property? Oh, well, I mean, I lived in the house for 20 years with my mom and she just died. Okay, do you have any other kids? You know, I mean, well, you don't even have to answer all those. I ask those questions, right? I get these questions probably every week. Somebody calls, hey, uh, I want to add my mom onto the house or my mom wants to add me on. Why? Well, you know, in case mom dies, that way I inherit the house. Oh, okay. Well, that's not necessarily true because mom only has 50% of the house. You know, or, you know, when she dies, she may have that 50 because dad passed away the other, you know, three years ago. And, uh, you know, the 50% goes to the other kids. So now we have one kid that owns 50% and the other kids own the other 50% equally. You know, I mean, it can get messy. People think they're trying to figure out the cheapest way possible to get something done. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So uh, probate is the uh, probate's the process where you take a will to get approved and, and verified and and to get the, the process going. Somebody comes to you and says, I've got a will and it says I get the property. It doesn't matter unless it's probated. It does not matter. Wills have no validity unless you take them to probate court and get them approved. And they will, they will submit the, the will to the court. They'll give what's called orders uh, testamentary or letters testamentary, which, uh, which assigns uh, an administrator or an executor to uh, as the executor of the estate. 
um, and then you'll they'll submit an inventory and all that. But at least usually uh, the court will give them the uh, power for contracts and sales of homes and all that kind of thing. And that's where they get the authority to be able to sell on behalf of the estate. Or if there was a transfer on death deed involved or something and they are already have inherited, great. Then they own the property and they can sign on their own. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so yeah, independent, dependent, independent just means, and in Texas, we do mostly independent administration. That means you don't have to go to the court for every single little thing you want to do. Independent, they say, here's the executor, have fun. Come call me if you got a problem or if somebody else says you're acting a fool, right? And you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And then they're challenging the will or, you know, challenging their authority and all that kind of thing. Dependent would be where uh, a lot of times where they died without a will and they have a big estate and now all the heirs are fighting over it. You need to get a determination of heirship and maybe the court will um, will assign somebody to act on as on behalf of the estate. And that's usually where you'll see the dependent administration. So if you have an heir, the court, the courts won't force you to do. Uh, you had one that forced it or will they? Okay, I could see where they would because there's several heirs that are going to get, you know, they're going to split the proceeds kind of thing. So I could see where they would. That might have been one of the other attorneys or one of the other parties saying, I want this. And so they forced it. It could just be uh, the executor decided that's the best way to figure out who's getting what. A lot of times it's because one of the heirs is buying out the other heirs and we want to make sure we're getting a fair value on paying somebody off kind of thing. Does this kind of uh, always have an understood default right to sell the property? Not always. Uh, in in their order, the judge's order, or in their, it's almost like a trust. If the trust doesn't allow you the power to sell, then, or even a power of attorney, if it doesn't have a, if it has powers to uh, sign a contract, it has power to, uh, you know, take money out of your bank account for you, but it doesn't give a power to buy and sell real estate. Well, then you don't have that power. So, so if, that, if that ability to sell the property is written into the petition uh, to the courts when seeking the intent of the administrator, yeah. Then when the typically the will will give them powers to do that too. Yeah. So once it's granted in that case, then they do have the right. Right. Yep. Okay. Right. And one of the things that we deal with here is that once the offer property is listed, we had the property listed, the our offers on the property, and an offer was accepted. But once that offer was accepted, once we get to court, before it can be finalized, there was a last session where the judge would allow higher bids to be presented in court before they finalize that sale. I don't know if they do that. Uh, that sounds to me like a good reason to move from California to Texas, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, I think it's, that's, yeah, that's typically in a guardianship situation where you're acting on behalf of somebody who's incapacitated or where there's a contentious situation where the judge wants to approve it because everybody's, yeah, that's a California thing. Most of the time it's independent administration. And they, yeah, right, yeah, and you don't have to, yeah, you don't have to file a bond as long as the will says that, which is, yeah, it's costly there too. So, uh, in this certain situation, a uh, person's mom died, she's an only child, uh, she willed a house to him. Uh, was she ever married? Hmm? Was she ever married? Yeah, he, he, yeah, yeah, he's deceased. When did she buy the house? Did she buy the house? Did she buy the house when she was married? No. no. She bought it after, long after. He died. So okay. Okay. The house is in her name. Okay. The mortgage is in her name. Right. The house was willed to the son. Okay. Uh, he has to go through probate in order to sell it. Uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, there is a will, but if it's not probated, there's a couple different things, that, and that's not on the slides. I wrote it down to talk about, but there are ways to do it outside of probate. And if everything, were, you know, we get these a lot. Like there's a lot of, uh, we have a parent county. There's a, a 
in South Fort Worth, there's a handful of this realtors been going in there and helping this neighborhood. And there's a lot of cleanup to do. We had one where uh, the last deed was from 1967 and it was grandparents that owned the home. And then a uh, son lived in the house and, or, you know, one of the uncles lived in the house and they had like 11 kids and he had lived there for 30 years, you know, something like that. So, and then of course, of course, this wasn't a million dollar home. It was like 60 grand. Right. And so, and so, yeah. And so we're trying to figure out where all the heirs are. Cause it's not just, Oh, I live there. So it's mine. You know, it doesn't happen that way. Right. But there are ways where you can use an affidavit of heirship and an affidavit of heirship that just reflects the marital and, and, and uh, family history of the, the person who died, the decedent. And uh, if that matches the will, then we can, we can just file those. And that's, you know, I draft those and we, we close with it. And it, we're essentially hearing title or connecting the dots in title from is mom it, to daughter. Is it done? Uh, then you probably have to have all of the heirs and all of the beneficiaries of the will sign it, or you have to go probate the will and the will, you know, the will is what takes precedence because that's what they wanted. Uh, yes, sometimes, sometimes. So, or there's uh, transfer on death deeds, which are very popular now, or what they call ladybird deeds, which are um, uh, they call enhanced life estate deeds. That's essentially, I deed it to my kids, but I reserve a life estate in it, and so it's mine until the day I die to be able to do whatever I want with it. And when I die, it automatically, upon death, goes to my beneficiaries that I listed. Same well, thing with a transfer on death deed. Ooh, I didn't know that. Yeah, a lot of know that. Yeah. It screws up, it screws up the, the Right. Lately, I've been preferring transfer on death deeds. A lot of times people use these to avoid Medicare. That's a good one yeah, to know. So yeah, and trusts are another thing. Uh, I view trusts in Texas as six of one, half dozen of another because trusts are more costly up front and you have to pay attention to them because if you sell your house, you need to put your house and deed it into the trustee of the trust, right? Well, if you sell your house and you buy a new one, you forget to put it back into the trust. And now you have this fancy shiny box that you paid for and nothing's inside of it, you know? And so it makes, sometimes makes that difficult. Also, there are other issues if they're older with Medicare, Medicaid, Medicaid reimbursement type things. If the house is in a trust, it may not qualify for the exemption. So you don't want to do that. Uh, with probate, it's easier, or with, with somebody passing away, it's easier to inherit than to put them on title and have them take title. Better tax-wise, it's just cleaner that way. A lot of people think, oh, just I'll add my kid onto the deed. Don't necessarily do that. So yeah, trusts are a good vehicle. They're a better vehicle in other states where probate's really expensive. Here, it's not very expensive. And here, depending on the county, it's not very time-consuming either. So it, it really, again, it depends. Yes, ma'am. Those really aren't a big thing in Texas. No, they're not. They're used more in some of the Midwest states. I know they're in uh, Oklahoma and I think Ohio has them, um, but really, no, we don't do those here. It would be easier because, uh, especially if you're leaving to a kid, because of marital property rights, because of homestead rights, um, if you're adding a kid onto the deed, you may lose some of your tax exemptions, like over 65, you may only qualify for half of it because you put somebody else on the mortgage or I'm sorry, I'm titled. You may screw up with your mortgage lender. They may call accelerate a loan because you added a new person on the title. There's all sorts of reasons why not to. The best way to do it would be put it in a will. I want it to go to Johnny, not, not to the others. They're getting something else or do a transfer on death deed where on my death, it's going to Johnny and it automatically will just like a bank account would. Those things go outside of the probate process. I mean, if they bought it that way, they bought it that way. It's... Can you change the deed once it's like if somebody closed the loan, husband and wife closed the loan years ago, they're getting near death, they want to avoid probate, can they go and change that deed to a transfer on death deed? Sure. Transfer on death deeds are uh, revocable. Transfer on they're revocable for one. So you wouldn't have to change, like nothing actually, title doesn't change because title's not changing until you die. So it's really just, it's, it's the equivalent of putting a beneficiary on your house, just like we do, we can do with cars, just like we do with bank accounts or retirement accounts, right? Those pass outside of probate because it says on death, 
you know, it goes to surviving spouse. And if not surviving spouse, it's going to kids one and two equally, you know, those kind of things. Those happen outside the probate process anyway, which is why most people, they have a home and they have bank accounts. They don't have, you know, a lake house and a ski, ski condo up in Aspen or something. So that's why a lot of times trusts aren't necessarily needed. Do a transfer on death deed for your house. It goes to the, you know, to the kids or whatever. And the bank accounts are all good. Unless it's a good, yeah, right. Yes, those are very specific. Yeah, those are, those are very specific. Yes. <laughs> How can common law marriage help or impact this in Texas? Texas has very strict common law rules. And there's like a five point test that you have to meet. There's so you know this. Okay, all right. So there's a three point test. It's been a long time. So, but what I know is people think, oh, I live with my girlfriend for five years, then we're common law married. No, it's another one of those assumptions like, oh, we live together. Now we're common law married. So this is half my stuff. Not necessarily. No, you're absolutely right. There's a certain, uh, it is, yes, we live for X number of years together, but it's also, did she, it, it's, did you hold yourselves out as a married couple? Did did she take your last name? Did you have the did, did you go to you know church and everybody saying you said this is my wife? You know, there's all sorts of extrinsic evidence to prove and prove up common law marriage. And it's not just we live together for five years automatically. You got to prove it up, and it's 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 a lot harder here than you think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it may just be something too where the the lawyers and the parties agreed to say we were common law married, and so that kind of they'll prove up facts if they want to. Where it comes really, where it becomes really hard is when somebody's trying to prove that up because girlfriend died, and you want half of her big account, and the rest of the family's like you know, it's like Anna Nicole Smith, you know that kind of thing, right? Except that they were married. Um, but it's kind of like they're trying to get they're trying to keep their money in there. And, you know, you're just the new spouse that came along and you're not even the new spouse. You're just a girlfriend living in the house, you know. And now you're like, well, no, we were coming along marriage. So now good luck proving it up. But that's what you would have to do is to prove it up. Yeah. Get that exact situation. Oh, yeah. So, OK, so we're about done. But um, a couple of red flags. So when you see a, a client that says um, my mom just died and I inherited the house and so we're selling it. Now you already know immediately there's a lot of death issues happening here or um, I'm getting divorced. So we want to sell. All right. The quick question is, are we getting divorced or do we have a divorce decree? That's the good question to ask, because now we know, are we going to have to deal with that ex-spouse or has that already been dealt with? Right. Um, and then you can go on from there. Hey, what's the relationship like? Is it amicable? Is it not? Because then it helps you do your job better and honestly do my job better, too. Um, uh, I inherited, uh, I'm getting divorced, a state of, those are kind of the, the quick ones. And then, you know, hey, you got to reach out to your title attorney to help you out, or you got to reach out to their lawyer to help out and the lender and how to best navigate through these kind of things. So um, I don't even know if I got through all of these, but any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, that yes, it does. Because essentially it makes a beneficiary and upon death, that's the beneficiary, just like a bank account would. And so it's, it's, it was only recently uh, the, the, the statute was created in 2015, I think. So it wasn't a thing. Um, you could do life estate deeds. That's kind of a different way to do it and different reasons why and why not. But, um, but yes, that's kind of a thing now that you can do in Texas that you used to not be able to. And it makes it a whole lot easier for somebody who is just your normal working class person who owns a home, but doesn't have, you know, two, three, four or five grand to drop on an attorney to get estate planning done kind of thing. Do you have an idea of what that costs to draw up a transfer on death fee? Oh, a transfer on death fee is a couple hundred bucks plus recording costs. And yes, I do those. I mean, what do you get Yes. Uh, yeah, Medicaid. Transfer on death. Yep. Yep. Yes. 
Right, because when you go into assisted living, if you no longer have any money, the government's paying for it, right? And if the government pays for it, when you die, they want to take all of your estate and recoup some of their money. So if you have a house, they will sell the house and the government gets to keep the money. If you do a transfer on death deed, at least in Texas, because every state has different Medicaid rules, uh, it transfers upon death, which means guess what? Medicaid comes back. There's no estate to take because it's in somebody else's name already. So it's an automatic upon death happens. So if you try to sell a house afterwards, that's not going to happen. They'll chase you down and put a lien on the property. Yes. It depends. <laughs> so, <laughs> every, every state has different rules and do things differently, right? So I've had people that had a trust in another state come to me and do, you know, um, I've had times where I've looked at it and I've decided we're just going to carve out a few things and, and put some like choice of law. We're going to use a Texas court, that kind of thing. Um, but what I don't know is if you own property here and you leave and go somewhere else, then talk to a lawyer in another state. If you're here in Texas and the property's here, then your trust will be fine. A trust will still work in another state. We just may, may be missing out on some of their rules that maybe don't apply to us kind of thing. And so it's not a, an immediate, yes, get a brand new will because you moved somewhere. Um, but you know, like for instance, I often counsel people just to get wills and you put trust language inside the will rather than you doing a trust right now. But if you're in California, get a trust done because it avoids probate. You don't have to have the judge approve every little thing you're doing and wait nine months and pay thousands of dollars. Like it saves a lot of money. Here it's a little different analysis, if you will. So, so the transfer on death. So I'll dance my good will. So okay. we don't know how long it's going to be. If he were to do a transfer on death to for their house, he would transfer on death to my mom. Okay. That would get them away from his Medicare or Medicaid that comes out. Is he in assisted living right now? No, he is. Okay. The, the government's not going to come after him for anything because he's not, he doesn't owe anything to anybody. But it would be Medicaid that would come out when you're in assisted living. Yes. Yeah, and I always, yeah, I always get those mixed up in my head Medicare, Medicaid, but yeah, yeah. Medicare is the health insurance. Yeah. Right. Yes. There, yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks. I'll, now I won't forget it. Yes. We have a deal right now that's getting canceled because there was a transfer on death deed and a will that said all to daughter. Son hadn't been in the picture. Now he's coming back in the picture and is trying to contest the will and contest the transfer, saying that mom had Alzheimer's and she shouldn't have been able to sign that. And I think he's full of crap, but I can't do anything about it because there's a pending litigation. Uh, it's kind of a related question. Isn't there like a period of time, like, yeah, you need to get the transfer on the death be done, not only when they, yeah, fill out middle records. But um, isn't there a certain period of time, like for the Medicaid situation, where that kind of has to happen in three to five years before you're really ready? Oh, the look back yeah. period. Yeah, look back. Yes. Because I think it's five years. If you're living, right. They look back and that. they view that as a fraudulent yeah. transfer. You're just trying to get away from getting giving the government the money to qualify to get into a nursing home. Right. Yes, but that's when you that's when you deed it to somebody else. So yeah, a lot of a lot of people. It's just like when they try to add somebody onto title before you know because they want to before they die. It's it's the same kind of thing. Well, why not just deed it to them now? And that way, I don't own it, and the government you know looks at me and and I don't have any you know I don't have any of the money there because I just gave it to them for free or for a song, right? Well, the government's going to come back within the last five years if you've done that, and they basically say you're you're trying to commit fraud. We're gonna we're gonna basically come at you, or you won't qualify for Medicaid for X number of months or years until that difference is made up. But a transfer on death deed is not that because yeah. no transfer has been made. Okay. It's made on death. So you could do that the day before you- You could, yeah. A Which is what happened with your, yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. We have to cash in their life insurance policy. We have to pay for their- Right. Expenses. If we have to pay everything off of that money, and then get the transfer on death. Yeah. 
All right, here's my cell phone number. There's cards back there for Kate. She's one of my six escrow officers. She's fantastic. One of the deals we do is, um, I don't believe in charging for notary fees. If if we can't go close, if your client can't make it to our place, we have six of them, they probably can make it. But if they can't, you know, teachers, they, they, they only got 40 minutes to close and, you know, they can't get out nine o'clock and go close some more without taking the day off. Somebody works on the line at GM, you know, they got a 12 hour shift, you know, those kind of things. Um, if we can't make the closing remotely ourselves, I'll pay for the notary fee. So it's one of the things I do. I just think it's it's a benefit to your client. I think it's a benefit to us because a lot of people just won't do that. Um, comes out of my pocket directly. It's not like I get it for free or Fidelity or Chicago's getting getting uh, reimbursing me or something. But it's just and and our mobile notary is awesome. He's Fidelity approved and he knows his stuff. Um, what is my number here? Seven five seven nine eight five two. So what? Nine eight five two. The the office is nine five eight three. That's a different one. Yeah, nine seven two seven five seven nine eight five two. Man, feel free to text me, call me, even text me. Just say, hey, this is this is my contact info. I'll add you to my phone. Um, but I'm always here to help people with their issues, and I, of course. Of course, we want your deals, but you know I'm always here to help. You got a T double O, and you're you know, and it's in Mansfield where I got an office. You know, we'll, somebody will go out and just sign it, or they can come by and we can notarize it for you, even though the deal's up here. All those kind of things. So let us be a resource for you, however we can. Yeah, and thanks for having me. I hope we got some valuable information uh, next week. Or Uh, company so basically like real estate broker brokers the sell of houses he owns a company that if you sell technology he can broker all of that technology out but the reason he's coming to speak is because he's keeping up with the artificial intelligence and the chat gpt and all of these different um, artificial intelligence softwares and platforms that are coming after some of our business so he's going to come talk and spend 45 minutes or so talking about how AI and this new technology could affect real estate, realtors, and that uh, type of thing. And since he's an expert in it and he deals with it every day, I thought he'd be the best person to come speak about it, other than some agent that's got on chat GPT and typed in a bunch of uh, prompts and spit something out because I've been to some of those trainings as well and personally it was wasting my time so I'm not here to waste your time so I'm trying to bring an expert to speak about this anyway um, <clears throat> be new to one next week I'm going to send uh, Jason's presentation out to everybody that was here today so probably by the end of the week or next week you'll get that whole presentation <clears throat> in your email as long as I've got it, which I should. So is there any questions before we break out, Chris? No, just one for just housekeeping. Um, if you are any 